Sarah Jameson. Our first story occurred in Palm Beach, Florida on July 13, 1997. Palm Beach is a fantastic location for any swimming or diving enthusiast looking for a good time. Sarah Jameson was a free diver from Delaware that wanted to enjoy the Floridian sights and activities, so she decided to spend one summer in Florida working on Palm Beach and enjoying her free time in the water. The summer went smoothly as she relished her work as a waitress and made some friends with her co-workers. Diving was a regular occurrence where Sarah went for one diving session every few days, but July 13th would be her last. In the early morning, Sarah walked to the cafe where she worked and started a shift. Amy, her friend and diving partner, said that she felt a bit nervous about their diving session in the afternoon because there was talk about a shark being sighted a few miles north from where they usually went swimming. Sarah was skeptical about the shark since it was so far away, so she convinced Amy that they should still go to their regular session and there was nothing to worry about. Later in the day, Sarah and Amy met up at the beach, bags in hand and diving gear ready. They were casual divers, so they never ventured too far out from the shore, and they usually dove down to where they felt most confident. Sessions never lasted longer than two hours, as they both had obligations to attend to during the day. When they arrived at the beach, quite a few people enjoyed the afternoon sun and having fun in the water. They left their things near the water and jumped in, as their shift at the cafe was particularly exhausting. After a bit of swimming, Amy suggested they should go a bit further out than last time because of all the people at the beach. Amy's words about the shark sighting from before lingered in Sarah's mind, but she agreed, and they swam out a few dozen yards. They commenced their dive and went down further than ever, as the deeper water meant a lower seafloor. The water was clear, and Sarah felt free swimming and looking for exciting things, as always. Through training, she learned to hold her breath for up to six minutes, but Amy wasn't as seasoned, so she had to frequently return to the surface. At one point, Amy tapped Sarah on the shoulder and pointed up to indicate that she needed air, so Sarah just nodded and kept swimming. She was awed by the number of seashells in the sand, and she spotted some kelp a bit further from her, so she decided to check it out. As she got closer to the flora, she noticed the water was considerably colder at this point and that there was movement near the kelp. Believing it to be fish, she swam up to get a closer look. By this point, she noticed her lung capacity was slowly reaching its limit that she would have to surface soon, but she decided to investigate the movement and then leave. As she got closer to the kelp, the dark, moving mass became more evident and just as her blood turned colder than the water around her, she realized she was face to face with a giant bull shark. The shark moved through the kelp, and Sarah could see its black dead eyes as it seemingly curved its movement and shot straight for, maw open and ready to eat. Sarah was frozen in fear, knowing she couldn't swim away from the beast, so she extended her arms and hoped for the best. To Sarah's amazement, the shark did not latch onto her arms, but moved and clamped down on her thigh instead. The pain was searing, and she barely managed to scream, knowing that losing her remaining breath meant her life would be snuffed out. Through the grimaces and flailing, she concentrated her thoughts on one thing, the gills. Sarah knew that shark's gills were very sensitive and that you should target them to get a shark to let go of you. With violent, jarring movements, she jammed her fingers in the shark's gills and pulled with everything she had. She felt the shark's teeth a bit harder and hit bone as its tail flailed in response to Sarah's fingers. The pain was worse than ever, but it quickly subsided as the shark finally released her thigh and disappeared in a red mist. Sarah pushed through the pain, still worried about where the shark had gone she swam quickly back to the surface, where she had trouble seeing due to her blood in the water. She felt weaker with each second it took to surface. When she finally got back, the warmth of the sun and the fresh air cleared her mind. She shrieked, alerting the people on the beach and Amy, who was floating on her back next to her. She immediately turned over and swam to her friend. They both began to swim back to the shore where people were waiting 
Confused about the commotion, Sarah was losing consciousness and they were still a dozen yards from the coast, so Amy knew they had to act quickly. As they neared the shore, the beachgoers realized what was happening and they ran into the water to help them, reaching them just in time. Since the beach they were on was close to the city, an ambulance quickly arrived, which took Sarah to the hospital. Luckily, her injuries weren't too severe, but a few more minutes of blood loss would have resulted in her death. Amy stayed with Sarah for her entire stay in the hospital and provided support. She recovered within a few weeks and was back bartending in Palm Beach, but never returned to the water. According to her report on the incident, she developed severe telassophobia, so her only swimming was in pools with clear water and a visible bottom. Nolan is a 17-year-old stand-up paddleboard student in California. He's been learning how to paddleboard for weeks now, and he's surprisingly amazing and faster than the other students at his young age. One day, he went to the beach after he headed home from school, bringing his stand-up paddleboard and paddle with him. He doesn't have a class today, but wants to try paddleboarding himself. He wanted to see how far he could go without Caroline's supervision. When he saw that the waves at sea looked good to surf or paddleboard on, he immediately started paddleboarding against them. He held firm onto his paddle and began to go against the waves, which he successfully went through. He was satisfied that he was doing great and all his paddleboarding lessons went well. He decided to return to the shore when something weird began to happen. As Nolan was paddling through the sea, he felt something weird underneath him. It was as if there's something big swimming underneath the paddleboard at the moment. He paused for a while and took a deep breath, when surprisingly, a great white shark sprung out of the water and attempted to bite him. The shark got back underwater and attacked Nolan again, throwing him off the paddleboard. Nolan panicked as he quickly picked up his paddle and swam through the water, when suddenly the shark charged toward him and tried to bite his leg but he luckily managed to kick the shark's face before it did. He felt relieved for a second until the shark returned to him again and attempted to bite his leg for the second time. Unfortunately, the shark got a hold of Nolan's leg and began to chew it violently, which caused it to bleed underwater. Nolan tried to kick the shark's face with all his effort using his other leg. He knew he would drown if the shark wouldn't stop biting him, so he kept kicking its face. When he realized that the paddle he was holding was a solid and heavy object, he used it to hit the shark's face repeatedly. The shark began to flinch, but Nolan could still feel its teeth against his skin, so he kept hitting the animal with the paddle until it decided to let his leg go and swim away. Nolan could feel the pain in his leg, but he managed to climb back to his paddleboard and paddle back safely to the shore. Luckily, a lifeguard noticed him immediately and decided to bring him to the hospital, where he was advised to rest until his leg was fully recovered from the severe shark bite. After the attack, the beach was temporarily closed and will remain closed until the shark warnings are lifted and people can swim again without the danger of being attacked by a shark, just like it did to Nolan. Thailand is a place with a very wide variety of sharks, some of which can prove to be a nuisance for people just trying to get by, be it by being a constant threat to the populace, by finding themselves where they should not be, or just by attacking people, even if unprovoked, although that scenario is much rarer. Our next story is about Ankali Sakta, a native of the island of Pukwak off the southeast coast of Cambodia. She lived in a small village on the island with her husband and infant daughter. They belonged to the lower class when it came to income, so they mostly got by by doing menial labor to support themselves. One day, as Ankali was getting ready to leave to attend to her household chores, her husband stopped by the house and asked them to take a stroll by the beach to relax. She agreed, and they went on their way. It didn't take long. The walk was less than 20 minutes. They took their daughter along as there was no one there to take care of her. Her name was Ayali. As they got to the beach, they noticed that quite a few people were there and it was crowded, and Ayali was getting nervous, so they decided to walk more inland through the forest connected to the beach. 
The shade provided refreshment and comfort, and they had a pleasant conversation while they walked along a river. At some point, they noticed that the bridge usually there had collapsed for unknown reasons, so they elected to wade through the water as it was slightly below waist height. At the halfway point of the river, Ankali felt something bite her leg, causing her to lose balance and fall into the water. As she did, she felt disoriented as she breathed in water, but her husband quickly pulled her up and onto her feet. She couldn't hear anything except for some muffled screaming. When her head cleared, she realized that the one screaming was her husband, and she was no longer holding Ayali. He was asking her where their daughter was, and they both noticed redness in the water, upon which he dove down and resurfaced, holding a bloody mess in the clothes that Ayali was wearing. Their daughter was gone. Some people nearby heard the commotion and rushed to help but nothing could be done. One reported seeing a small white-tipped shark swim down the river back toward the ocean. They were amazed that a shark might wander up the river as they had never been spotted there, and that river was where children often came to swim and have fun. The bystanders tried to help calm Onkali down, but it was pointless. She remained on the side of the river, wailing for the better part of an hour. They returned to their house and had a funeral for their daughter a few days later. No one ever swam in that river again. The second story tells of a young Australian surfer named Leo Taylor, who miraculously survived an attack from a tiger shark while surfing. Leo is a 19-year-old surfer who is currently at the Gold Coast Beach in Australia to do his most loved hobby of surfing. Since he began surfing, he's enjoyed riding huge and small waves. The waves were huge on this day, so he decided to go surfing. Leo could have continued surfing against gigantic waves for another hour or so. Still, he spotted some dolphins off in the distance and became fascinated by them. Leo decided to stop surfing and sat on his surfboard to watch the dolphins for a while. Being the dolphin lover, he couldn't take his eyes off the dolphins freely roaming the waters. The dolphins were now too far from Leo as he still wanted to see them up close. Leo decided to swim farther away from shore to follow the dolphins. When he got close to the dolphins, he sat down on his surfboard and watched them. Upon watching the dolphins, Leo felt something wrong with the water. He felt as if something big was coming for him from underneath. He was instantly terrified as images of a shark lurking nearby filled his head. With this, he immediately decided to paddle back to shore, which was far away from where he was at sea. As he nervously paddled through the water, a tiger shark charged toward him from underneath, tearing his surfboard apart in two pieces. Luckily, Leo dodged the attack but saw that the shark was now heading toward him next. He decided to swim to the shore, but the shark managed to catch up to him and bit his left arm. Leo screamed in pain as the shark tried to tear his arm off his body. Determined to get away, Leo repeatedly punched the shark's nose with all the strength in his right arm. He also hit the shark in the eye despite the discomfort from the shark's teeth delving deep into his skin. When Leo poked the shark's gills, the shark immediately released his hand and swam away, allowing Leo to swim back to shore as fast as he could. As soon as Leo arrived at the coast, his other surfing mates were shocked to see that his left arm was severely damaged by the shark bite. They then took him to a nearby hospital to sterilize and treat his wound. On August 4, 1974, Molly's heart raced with excitement and expectation. She was on a bus heading for a popular aquarium at an undisclosed location in the Midwestern U.S. Her school had booked a trip for the top graduates of her class, and she was one of the lucky ones to be chosen. As she got closer to her appointed seat, her palms started to sweat more and more. She was about to see so many species of fish. The teacher counted the students when they were about to start the trip and gave the driver a nod of approval. The day was beautiful and looked to be enjoyable for everyone. One could sense the enthusiasm in the air. To calm down, Molly sat still and thought about the day ahead. 
This was the furthest away from home she had ever been, so the positive expectation was overshadowed by anxiety and thinking about things that could go wrong. She resorted to listening to music to pass the time. After about an hour or so, they arrived at the aquarium. Shark's home had opened a few days before their arrival. Marie and Henry, two marine biologists, were the brains behind the idea, as they wanted to bring the youth closer to nature so they could understand the importance of it. They were completely enamored by both the ocean and the life it houses. In fact, they met because of their shared commitment to marine life while researching the same area by chance. The students were welcomed to the aquarium by Marie and Henry, who gave them a tour and introduced them to the different kinds of fish they had. Eventually, they reached the shark tank. Marie started her explanation by saying that sharks are among the most intriguing and misunderstood marine animals. Although they are frequently considered deadly and dangerous, sharks are essential to marine ecology. They are essential to maintaining the ocean's food chain balance. However, several shark species can be fatal to people if they are provoked or if they believe they are their meal. Much to the disappointment of the students at the aquarium, they did not have any of the ferocious shark species they had seen in the movies. Instead, they just had a healthy shiver of black-tip sharks. Black-tip sharks are not as large as other species of shark and are usually quite timid unless provoked. They usually reach a size of six feet. Most of the sharks in this tank were about that size, and they were recently moved, adding to their stress. As Molly listened to Marie's fascinating facts, she couldn't help but notice one of her classmates, Jack, looking around airily, not paying attention, even though they had just gotten to the sharks. She asked him if everything was okay, and he said he was fine. He lingered around the sharks as the rest of them went on. It's crucial to realize that, contrary to popular belief, these sharks do not deliberately seek out humans to eat. Most shark attacks result from mistaken identity, in which the shark confuses a human for one of its usual food species, like a seal or a fish. Marie continued her explanations as they went on. Sometimes Henry would step in to get his word, which the students found affectionate and nice. They were captivated by their explanations, oblivious to the horror about to unfurl in front of them. As they got to the coral displays, Marie's gaze lifted from the children and into the distance, followed by a scream. She saw Jack standing on the shark tank, looking down into it. He did not respond to any yells. Molly was horrified by the sight, and her thoughts were identical to everyone else's. They prayed that their friend would not fall into the tank. Just as Marie was within a few yards of the tank, screaming at him to come down, he snapped out of it and looked at her. He lost his footing, and the world seemed to come to a standstill as Jack splashed into the tank, causing the sharks to scatter momentarily before closing in on him. He flailed in the water in panic as the red mist burst all around him. The sharks were agitated, having just been introduced to the tank, and they were also hungry. The sharks bit into Jack one at a time, going for his limbs for the most part. Molly could see him screaming inside the tank and urge Marie and Henry to help him in any way they could. Knowing that getting in the tank was no option, Henry grabbed a pickaxe left over by the building crew the previous day. He slammed the pick into the tank, bursting it open at a point. The glass shattered and the water engulfed the area around the tank. Marie urged the kids to back away as the sharks and Jack came out of the tank and onto the ground. The shark's jaws snapped as Henry pulled Jack back to the group. His wounds were deep, but no arteries were hit. The boy was in shock due to the blood loss and the cold water, so they immediately called emergency services while Marie wrapped him up in a blanket from their office. He was responsive, and the paramedics managed to arrive on time to take him to the hospital. As the ambulance left the scene, the supervisor of the school group went ballistic at Marie and Henry for their incompetence in maintaining the safety standards of their aquarium. 
The students were escorted back to the bus to await the police, after which they gave their statements and were on their way. Sharks cannot survive without water for long, so the black-tipped sharks in that tank did not make it. The aquarium was served a hefty fine and faced a lawsuit by the school and the children's parents, which eventually drove them to bankruptcy and the closure of their aquarium. The last Molly heard of them, they worked menial odd jobs where they could. In Jack's case, when asked about his actions that day, he stated that he did not remember climbing onto the shark tank. He pulled through and made a full recovery. Connor Wright Tourists on vacation can usually be divided into two groups. The leisure types that like to lounge on the beach all day, and the thrill seekers that look for new experiences wherever they can find them. Connor Wright, the subject of our next story, falls into the latter group. He was a mechanic from Austin, Texas, who had saved enough money to go to Australia with his friends, something they had discussed for years. On August 2, 2005, Connor, Elliot, and Jack landed in Australia and traveled to their accommodation near Gold Coast, where they would plan their next week's adventures. The first few days were spent taking in the sights and bar hopping to find a good time, with the fourth day of their stay entirely devoted to jet skiing. Connor and Elliot were adrenaline junkies by nature, so they were all for the activity, but Jack insisted that they go and he would spend some time relaxing on the beach. After tries to convince their friend to join them failed, they decided to spend a few hours jet skiing the next day. Neither of them had experienced riding a jet ski before, but both were in the same trade as mechanics, so they understood the basics. After they rented out their jet skis, they tried to convince Jack to join them one last time, but he still wasn't enthused about the idea of the activity. They respected his choice and went for the horizon where there were no swimmers and nothing to bother them. They took a bit to get used to riding the jet skis, but they were speeding across the water surface quickly. The thrill was intense and they would often stop and sit next to each other and chat. During one of the breaks, Elliot suggested they race the jet skis to a large rock jutting out of the water a few hundred yards away. Although unsure of himself, Connor was never one to back away from a challenge and accept it. They lined their jet skis up, counted down, and took off slowly toward the rocks. They had agreed that they would stop a safe distance from the stones, but an issue occurred when Connor noticed his jet ski was not behaving the same way as before. It was moving up from the surface of the water and bobbing aggressively. He tried to signal Elliot to stop but could not get the message across because of the splashing water around them. In a fraction of a second, Connor's hands lost their grip on the jet ski's handles as it flung itself out of the water and rotated backward, landing him on his back. The pain of striking the water surface was bad enough, but the real pain came when he realized that the water around the rocks they were racing to was much more shallow than expected with more rocks under the surface. Connor broke his femur on one of the rocks while falling into the water, making him scream in agony. Elliot saw what happened and steered toward Connor, asking him if he was all right. Through moans and tears, he explained what happened to his friend and clung to the side of the jet ski, legs dangling under the surface. The sea salt stung his wound, which throbbed with tremendous pain but neither registered much blood in the water. As Connor tried to calm down from breaking his leg, he was startled by the painful feeling of sandpaper being dragged across his belly. Something to note about sharks is that their skin is extremely rough and covered in shield scales, tiny tooth-like protrusions that will damage things a shark bumps into. Connor did not know this and panicked at the alien and painful feeling on his skin this made him slip from the jet ski and fall under the surface, where he saw a massive shark circling in his blood and tilting itself up toward him. He immediately let go of his jet ski and begged Elliot to pull him up, screaming about the shark and how it was coming for him. Just as Elliot grabbed his arm to pull him up, Connor screamed and was pulled below the surface again, with nothing holding him up but Elliot's struggling hand. 
Under the surface, Connor's eyes were stung by the salty water, and he couldn't see anything. He could only feel the shark's sharp teeth grinding against the bones of his shin. The pain was immense, and he tried to kick the shark away, but his broken femur did not allow that. He tried reaching for the shark's snout, but it was out of his reach. Within a second, he felt his bones snap, and he released his breath as he let out an agonizing scream. The pressure on his shin was gone, and he felt pulled from the water. Elliot hoisted Connor on the jet ski and immediately set for the shore where someone would help them. He had to hurry as Connor was profusely losing blood, but he couldn't risk him falling in the water again. One mistake could mean the shark would return and finish the job. Elliot and Connor reached the shoreline within a few minutes. The crowd at the beach scrambled to help the pair, and they managed to get Connor to safety and tie his leg stump off with a tourniquet. Hope was fleeting, however, as the only thing keeping Connor conscious was the adrenaline of the incident, and the real pain was starting to show. Shortly after reaching the shore, the ambulance took the three friends to the nearest hospital so Connor could be treated. His lower leg was lost, and his femur was snapped clean in half, and it was clear that he would not leave the hospital soon. It took two weeks for him to stabilize and regain some strength to endure the flight home, where he would need further treatment. All in all, it took Connor many years to learn to walk with a prosthesis, and he said he would avoid anything deeper than a pond from then on out. The shark was eventually recognized as the tiger shark and was relocated from the area of the incident. People are usually scared of the unknown, and one of the biggest unknowns that humanity has still not explored to the fullest is the ocean. The ocean harbors a variety of primordial life that can kill anyone easily, but few strike fears into the hearts of humans as sharks do. Sharks are one of the oldest predators in the world's oceans. They have remained unchanged, perfect, and as hungry as ever. The ferocity of a provoked shark is a force of nature on its own, something that Emma Ferguson would find in her deadly encounter with an annoyed bull shark at her local aquarium. Story 1 Emma Ferguson, a college student studying engineering in Columbus, Ohio, intended to switch schools once her pre-engineering program was up. She had always wanted to be a marine biologist, but some personal issues held her back from that dream, so she took up the next best degree, according to her parents' wisdom, engineering. Although she enjoyed the courses and had no issues passing her finals, she didn't feel fulfilled from the experience. She was not the most popular girl, but she had a close-knit friend group that preferred to spend their time indoors playing Dungeons & Dragons or video games. One of her friends, Marco, worked in a zoo near their city and would often bring his friends in after hours to enjoy the animals without concern for other people being a bother. One day, Marco invited Emma and another friend, May, to visit the zoo late at night because they were installing two new exhibits in the aquarium a shark tank, and a seal enclosure. Emma and May jumped at the opportunity as it seemed exciting, so they met Marco at the zoo the following night. Arriving at the zoo, Emma and May found it creepy since no people were around, but Marco was comforting. Men were working on the enclosures with the animals still in them, so they elected to walk around the zoo until the work was done. They visited various enclosures but were disappointed that their favorite animals were sleeping. However, nocturnal animals were a sight as they roamed freely around their enclosures. After about an hour of walking around the zoo, the trio returned to the newest exhibit and marveled at the size of the shark tank and how cute the seals were. These animals were understandably stressed from transport and seemed to be on edge, but the group didn't register this as they were still in awe. The girls walked up to the seals and admired them and their fat little bodies while Marco took a special interest in the sharks. As the girls looked at the seals, Marco climbed up the small platform to the top of the shark tank, which had a flimsy plastic lid to keep it shut, likely to make feeding easier for the keepers. Marco was a keeper, but he had been on the job for only a few months and usually kept to the reptile enclosures. He snapped open the lid in one section of the tank and stared into it. 
When May called him out on this stupid decision, he told them to climb up with him and check it out. May refused outright, but Emma was curious and climbed the platform despite her friend's warnings. When she reached the top, she was amazed at the sharks and how gracefully they were gliding through the water below them. They whispered among themselves about how elegant they looked and seemed so close. Emma, seemingly entranced, slowly reached out for the water to feel its temperature. It felt cold, shockingly so. She dug deeper into the tank as the sharks congregated at the bottom. There were three of them in total, three massive bull sharks. She turned her gaze toward Marco with tears in her eyes. She told him she regretted not pursuing her dream of studying marine life as originally intended. She said the moment the two of them shared could have been her day-to-day -day life, but she was stuck doing something she hated. Marco hugged her and said things always turned out well, but they didn't consider that one of the sharks was getting much closer to the top of the tank. The two turned back to look at the tank, and Emma pulled her still hand back. The sudden movement caused the shark to flex in the water and surge towards Emma's arm. It was too fast. Emma screamed as the shark clamped down its strong jaws on the middle of her forearm, pulling her to the floor above the tank. Marco held her up and didn't let the shark's weight pull her into the tank, only making her scream worse. Sharks usually let go of their prey after the first bite, but these sharks were stressed and hungry, so it only held on to her out of desperation for a meal. It pulled harder and harder until Emma felt the most shocking and burning pain she had ever felt in her life. Degloved. The skin from her forearm gave way and followed the shark's teeth into the cold water. Emma shrieked as her arm burned, but passed out from all the pain. Marco pulled her back from the tank, panting and throwing up at the sight of the mangled tendons and blood still dripping from her skinless arm. He told May to call an ambulance right after Emma got bit, so they were on their way. He gripped the part of her arm that still had skin with all his might to staunch the bleeding while May ripped up her hoodie to apply a tourniquet to her arm. They succeeded and the blood stopped flowing, but Emma was still not responding to them. They could hear paramedics running through the zoo hallways to get to them, since they were in an urban area and the ambulance's response time was remarkably short. This speed ended up being the only reason Emma survived the incident as she started to go into shock. They carried her off to the vehicle and left Marco and May on the ground in their urgency. May slapped Marco for letting her do something stupid, but Marco broke down in sobs. They sat there for 30 minutes, unsure of what to do. Ultimately, they went to the hospital to see their friend, but it took a week for her to stabilize enough to talk to anyone. She pulled through the incident, with her doctors claiming she would have to get grafts to mend the damaged skin. However, the psychological scars never healed, and Emma developed an irrational fear of fish and large animals, which crippled her desire to be a marine biologist. Marco lost his job and decided to quit college due to the depression that set in after he blamed himself for Emma's incident. Even though Emma forgave him for what happened, they cut ties and moved on with their lives. The first story features an American fisherman named Blake Williams and his encounter with a very aggressive great white shark. Blake is off to sea with three other fishermen named Charlie, Andrew, and Jack to fish for some tuna. The three were on their boat and ready to lower their first net. While Blake and Jack watched, Andrew and Charlie were the first to drop the net. When they felt their net become heavy after the first couple of minutes, they decided to lift it and saw they had caught a decent number of tuna. Once Blake and Jack had lowered the second net, the men were satisfied with their catch. They first moved to a different ocean area to increase their tuna catches. Blake and Jack then dropped the second net afterward. Upon lowering the second net, Jack could sense something wrong with the water. He felt as if there was something huge moving underneath the waters in front of them. Hey Blake, I feel like there's something wrong with this part of the sea, Jack stated as Blake gave him a smug look. There's nothing wrong here, Jack. Only if you do something dumb, then there is something wrong. Blake replied as the two of them shared a good laugh after lowering the second net. 
The two fishermen first waited a few minutes before testing to see if the net was too heavy to lift. Blake decided to check it on his own as Jack sat on the boat floor. When Blake held the trap underneath the water, he was surprised to see that it was heavy. He wanted to tell Jack about it, but he decided to lift it himself. As soon as he lifted the net, an aggressive great white shark jumped from the water with its jaws open wide, attempting to bite Blake's hand. Blake immediately released the net from his hands as he stepped back in pure shock. Jack, Andrew, and Charlie were all startled by the attack as they approached Blake to ask if he was okay. While they were talking to Blake, the shark jumped from the water again, and this time it tried to bite off Blake's leg. Luckily, Jack managed to pull him away from the boat's edge beforehand. Seconds later, they felt a loud thump from underneath the boat and realized that it was the shark again, frustrated as he didn't get a chance to bite Blake's hand or leg. The shark kept bumping underneath the boat as the four fishermen held on for their lives. Charlie, who was in charge of maneuvering the boat, managed to get to the steering wheel and immediately started the engine to drive away from the shark. Blake, Andrew, and Jack kept holding on to the boat as it moved away from the shark. Looking back, Blake realized that the angry shark was still following them, so he ordered Charlie to speed up. The shark just disappeared underneath the waters after a few minutes, leaving the four of them with the most terrifying experience they'd had in their many years of fishing. Our next story takes us to Boa Viagem, Brazil, where Natasha Volkov, a Russian tourist, visited Boa Viagem in the summer of 1998 as a vacation from her stressful job as a nurse in Vladivostok. She was 28 years old, and accompanying her on the trip was her boyfriend, Ilya, who worked as a welder. The two met when Ilya accompanied his friend to the hospital after he burned his hand on some welding equipment. They talked after his friend was taken care of and eventually started dating. The weather in Boa Viajem was terrible during their stay. For the first four days of their one-week vacation, they had a lot of rain that made going outside quite unpleasant so they just went to restaurants and stayed inside, relaxing. However, on the last three days of their stay, the weather cleared up and presented them with high temperatures and plenty of sun to go to the beach. Natasha was excited to go to the beach, and Ilya shared her enthusiasm. They made it to the beach, and Natasha noticed that a vendor was selling floating mattresses, so she bought one and decided she would float in the water for most of the day and enjoy her time off. Ilya helped his girlfriend blow the mattress up and decided to read a book in the shade and then walk around and have a beer. The water was cold when she entered it since it was still early, around 9 a.m. The couple wanted to maximize their beach time, so they arrived early. Lounging around on the mattress was pure bliss for Natasha, so much so she ended up dozing off and drifted away from shore for a considerable distance. She opened her eyes to a kaleidoscope of colors shifting in her vision due to the intense sunlight, and she realized she had drifted a few hundred yards away from the shore. After the initial wave of panic subsided, she realized that she was on a mattress after all, so she could paddle her way back to the shore with her arms. She even took this as another opportunity to relax, as the sun's heat felt quite nice on her back. This is the point where things went wrong for Natasha Volkov. Something to note about most shark species is that they are quite observant and tend to spot shapes when they are hunting. So the shape of something floating on the surface of the water can be something like a seal or an unknowing woman relaxing. As Natasha got within 100 yards of shore, she noticed movement underneath her mattress, which caused her to worry. She paddled faster. After a few moments, she felt a strong force bump into her stomach, lifting her about a foot into the air. She yelped in surprise and tried to paddle even faster, but it was in vain. Her mattress was punctured. It started leaking air into the water quickly, and Natasha lost speed. As the surface of the mattress started falling below the surface of the water, Natasha looked up to see the populated beach and its tourists minding their own business. She started crying as she realized that no one knew what was happening and no one was coming to help anytime soon. Her face reached the water 
and her attacker's presence was made clear by a single thing, a dorsal fin. She saw the bull shark zip past her and a bit further away, so she started flailing and screaming as she swam to shore with everything she had. Some people took notice and pointed Natasha out to the lifeguard on the beach, who immediately ran in and started swimming in her direction. She was still some 70 yards away from shore, but her progress was impeded by a searing pain in her right side. The shark had circled and came back to bump into her again. The shark's rough skin caused Natasha to bleed into the water. Not much, but this is a shark we're talking about. The scent of blood in the water heightened the shark's sense of smell, making it more determined and hungry. Seconds later, Natasha felt the shark bite into her thigh just above her knee and pull her under the surface. The shark flailed and thrashed as it held Natasha in place, and she exhausted most of her precious breath screaming underwater, so each second was valuable. She tried pushing the shark away from her leg, but it was not letting go. In utter desperation, she started gouging its eyes, scratching them, but that only made her hands bleed. It wasn't until she moved her hands down and pulled the shark's gills that it finally let go of her leg. After one last convulsion, the beast surged past Natasha once more, skidding across her belly and making her bleed even more. By this time, the lifeguard had finally made his way to the victim and pulled her back to the surface. Natasha breathed life back into her lungs and screamed immediately afterward, but the lifeguard held her close and told her to calm down and to hold on to him. He turned and started swimming back to shore quickly, as he understood that time was of the essence and that the shark could have been back at any second. They returned to the shore within a few minutes, and Natasha began feeling dizzy due to blood loss. They laid her down, and the lifeguard assessed her wounds and decided she needed an ambulance. One was called by a bystander as soon as they saw Natasha's wounds so the sirens could be heard in the distance. During this time, Ilya was walking back to their bags on the beach when he heard the commotion and noticed his girlfriend was attacked by something. He dropped his things and immediately ran to help her, pushing through the crowd and helping her stay steady while the ambulance arrived. It got there in a few minutes and Natasha was swiftly taken to the nearest hospital and her wounds were tended to. It took her a few hours to stabilize, after which Ilya apologized profusely for not being there to save her from the beast. Natasha remarked that she knew he couldn't swim and didn't want to go into the water. He sat with her for the entirety of her recovery and provided all the support he could, even though she got to walk normally again. He accompanied her to every therapy session and stuck with her to the end, eventually leading to their marriage a few years later. In the picturesque coastal town of Byron Bay, Australia, lived a young and adventurous boy named Andy. With sun-kissed hair and a spirit that matched the golden shores, Andy spent his days exploring the ocean's wonders and embracing the thrill of new adventures. One sunny day, Andy was on a pristine beach where he planned to test his newly acquired drone. Eager to capture breathtaking aerial shots of the crystal clear waters, he carefully calibrated his device and launched it into the sky. As the drone soared higher and higher, Andy marveled at the stunning view it provided, capturing the vibrant hues of the coastline. However, in a cruel twist of fate, the drone suddenly lost connection and spiraled out of control. Panic gripped Andy's heart as he watched his prized possession hurtle toward the unforgiving waters below. Fueled by desperation, he made a split-second decision. He would attempt to retrieve his drone, no matter the cost. Disregarding the warnings that echoed in his mind, Andy plunged into the water without hesitation. With each stroke towards the drone's last known location, his heart raced, a mix of unwavering determination and underlying fear. The weight of the water pulled at his limbs, but Andy pushed forward his eyes fixed on the surface. Meanwhile, on the beach, Andy's father, Jeff, noticed his son's reckless endeavor. A man of unwavering love and protective instincts, Jeff knew he had to act swiftly to save his child from the impending danger. 
With his heart pounding, he sprinted towards the water, fear fueling his every step. Upon reaching the site where the drone had crashed, a wave of despair washed over Andy's heart. The crashing waves enveloped him, obscuring his vision and instilling an unsettling sense of foreboding. In a sudden and chilling moment, a dark shadow emerged from the deep, a shark. Andy's heart raced, fear seizing his entire being. The shark immediately pounced on Andy's arm, causing him to cry out and scream in extreme pain. He was panicking and trying to pull his arm out of the shark's mouth, but it was useless. The shark was now trying to shake his body in the water, causing him to feel pain, not just in his bitten arm. As the shark attacked Andy, his father Jeff leaped into action. With the strength of a lion and a love for his son that knew no bounds, Jeff tackled the shark, diverting its attention away from Andy and releasing the poor boy's bloodied arm. The predator's powerful jaws clenched around Jeff's arm, causing searing pain to shoot through his body. Despite the agony, Jeff refused to relent. He wrestled with the shark, summoning every ounce of strength he possessed. The battle raged on, father against nature's fury, as Andy watched in awe and terror. Jeff pried the shark's jaws with bravery and determination, allowing Andy to swim away safely. As Andy reached the shore, his father emerged from the water, bloodied but victorious. The bond between them was unbreakable, forged by the crucible of adversity. People on the beach were astonished, marveling at the heroic act they had just witnessed. Andy clung to his father, tears mingling with the salty ocean spray, overwhelmed with gratitude for his father's selfless bravery. Their lives had been forever changed in those terrifying moments, but their love and resilience had triumphed over the jaws of tragedy. News of the extraordinary rescue spread like wildfire, touching the hearts of people across the globe. Jeff's courageous act inspired countless individuals, reminding them of the incredible lengths a parent would go to to protect their child. As the wounds healed, a newfound appreciation for life blossomed within Andy and Jeff. They learned to cherish every moment, never taking their time together for granted. The beach that had once been the setting of their darkest hour now held a deeper significance, a testament to the strength of their bond and the indomitable spirit of a father's love. In the picturesque Port Macquarie, nestled along shores, two high school friends, Ethan Byers and Lily Monroe, thought they would skip school for the day and go for a swim. It was a warm spring day, the sun beaming down from a clear blue sky, and the monotony of their daily routine drove them to give in to a moment of rebellion. Ethan, a charismatic and thrill-seeking teenager, proposed skipping school and venturing to a secluded cove along the shore. Lily, who shared his thrill-seeking spirit, couldn't resist and agreed to go with him for the day. Leaving the confines of the school behind, Ethan and Lily set out on their journey with bicycles so they could come home more easily. The anticipation grew with each pedal stroke as they neared the cove, a hidden gem tucked between rocky cliffs and embraced by the turquoise embrace of the ocean. The cove was completely isolated from where people might like to walk, so they thought it was the perfect place where no one would find them. The marine life teemed with a diverse array of creatures, but mostly just small fish and the odd crab. They left their backpacks in the corner of the cove under some trees and immediately went swimming. The pair had known each other for a long time and such outings were common. They swam in the water, relaxing as the weather was ideal for a swim. They circled the cove and cracked jokes the entire time not having a care in the world. However, things started to change when the damp hairs on his neck stood up. Lily, who was still swimming next to him, turned around and cried as she started to flail in the water. Ethan looked back to check, but it was too late. A massive bull shark was behind them, not slowing down and heading directly for Ethan. He tried to swim back to the shore, but the shark had already caught up and clamped down on his right hamstring not letting him move his leg. 
Lily could hear his tendons snapping under the water and kept screaming, unsure of what to do. He simply screamed and screamed until his head was pulled under the surface. Instinct kicking in, Lily started swimming fiercely toward the shore, where she sat on the sand and screamed for Ethan. A moment later, he emerged again, waving his arms around and screaming through gurgles. He was there only momentarily, before getting dragged under the surface again. Sharks are notorious for not killing their prey immediately, but taking bites and slamming into it underwater until it dies. This was exactly what had happened to Ethan while he was under the surface. Lily sat there, paralyzed from shock and fear, as she saw the splashing water die down to only ripples, and the water was painted a deep red. She knew he was gone, but she couldn't accept it. She remained there for an undisclosed amount of time, just staring at where she saw Ethan and cursing the day that they decided to skip school. Her trance was only broken by his body floating to the surface, mangled beyond recognition. At that point, she finally passed out from the shock. Later, she was hyperventilating as she realized where she was but she still tried her best to walk away from the scene and find someone to help her. No one was near the cove or on the surrounding beaches, so she had to walk back to town, knowing that Ethan's body might get swept away to sea if she didn't hurry. She walked into the first convenience store, stammering about what happened to the frightened clerk who called emergency services. They were dispatched to the scene with two medics staying in the store to talk to Lily and ensure she was okay. When the police arrived, Ethan was already floating toward the horizon, but they managed to recover him and alert his family about what had happened. Lily never really recovered from the incident, even though years had passed. She constantly blamed herself for what happened, and it took years of therapy to get over that, but not over the bad dreams or the regret of that day. Our first shark attack survivor is Malia, a 16-year-old surfer from Oahu, Hawaii. Malia is a surfing prodigy in Oahu, Hawaii. She is well known among surfers for her outstanding surfing abilities, which she demonstrated at a young age. She often goes to a famous surfing spot in Oahu to practice every day and attend surfing competitions in which she almost always wins. One day, Malia went to her favorite surfing spot in Oahu to practice for a local surfing competition. The waves in that spot are incredibly huge, which she likes about surfing there. It was a hot afternoon, with Malia surfing in the waters with her trainer. Also, her dad, named Makoa, served as a lifeguard to monitor his daughter while surfing. After riding some pretty big waves, Malia swims back to the shore to give herself a little rest. Her dad Makoa carried her giant surfboard for her as she changed into another wetsuit to surf again after a few minutes. Be careful Malia, Makoa said, as he gave Malia her surfboard before she went back into the water. Malia paddled her surfboard a few meters away from the shore until she reached the surfing spot and began to ride the first wave. However, both Malia and Makoa are aware of the recent threat regarding Galapagos sharks, one of the most dangerous sharks roaming around Hawaii. Makoa has taught Malia how to deter sharks using her bare hands, so he's convinced that his daughter is far from being attacked. Meanwhile, Malia has been happily surfing the big waves simultaneously coming her way. She glances at her dad, who was on the shore cheering for her, when the most unexpected happened. While surfing, a shark suddenly pounced on her left leg, causing her to fall off the surfboard. Malia was surprised by the attack, followed by a stinging yet quick bite on her right leg. The waves were big and fast enough to hide the creature attacking her, but she was sure it was a Galapagos shark. Malia was overwhelmed by the waves as the shark kept pouncing on her to take advantage of the situation. When she finally grabbed her surfboard, she used it to shield herself from the aggressive shark and escaped the situation by swimming through the waves. Blood was already flowing from her wounds caused by the shark, but she was determined to survive. When Malia's plan worked, the shark kept pouncing and attacking the surfboard as she subtly swam away and called her father for help. 
Makoa, who saw what happened and realized that his daughter was still alive, immediately went into the water to rescue her. As soon as they got to shore, Malia was covered in cuts and wounds caused by the shark. She was then carried into a nearby clinic where she was treated and bound to recover from the deadly attack. Tom Brooke had always been fascinated by the ocean. He read many books on marine biology and similar topics in his teenage years. Further education on the topic was limited, so the next best thing for Tom was to take up an interest in surfing. He frequently spent his weekends hitting waves with his friends, spending hours in the water surfing and snorkeling. On August 18, 2012, Tom went to the usual beach he and his friends would frequent to have fun. They met up in the morning and planned to swim, eat food, then return to surfing for the rest of the day. When they first entered the water, Tom noted that he didn't feel like his usual self. He felt flush and disoriented, so he lounged on the beach until he felt better. His friends agreed, so they swam around a bit before accompanying their friend to a nearby restaurant to make him feel better. Some friendly banter and pasta later, Tom felt himself again and wanted to start surfing as soon as possible. They got their surfboards ready and paddled a few hundred yards from the beach. Catching waves as a surfer often entails sitting on your board, waiting for the wave to build up to catch it, so that's what they did. Tom noticed his friends were already on a wave while waiting, so he cheered them on. He remained sitting on his board, admiring the agility of his friends and how good they were at surfing. The calm water sloshed around him, and he expected a wave to start forming. But his excitement turned to horror as he looked to the side to see a dorsal fin sticking out of the water, followed by the giant mouth of a bull shark that bit into his leg. He screamed and lost his balance, causing him to flip into the water and get thrown around by the shark. Bull sharks are notorious for being aggressive and persistent with their food, so this was just the tip of the iceberg for Tom. His friends heard the scream and quickly started paddling to his aid, but they were still far off. In excruciating pain, Tom was still under the water, eyes burning because of the salt. The shark was not letting go. He tried to flail around and gouge its eyes, but it was still not giving up. In fact, it seemed as though it only made the shark angrier. By that point, one of the friends arrived at the scene, thrust his hand under the surface and clutched Tom with everything he had. He started pulling while Tom pushed the shark off his leg, and they miraculously managed to get Tom on his friend's board. They both knelt on the board, panting, with Tom moaning in pain. His leg was searing with pain and bleeding profusely. His muscles were ripped and tendons were torn, but Tom insisted on getting to shore as soon as possible. He didn't tell his friend, but he started losing consciousness. They reached the beach in a few minutes to a crowd of onlookers curious about the screaming. His friend helped him stand on one leg while he screamed for someone to call an ambulance. Tom's other friend rushed over and told them that he had already called an ambulance a few minutes away. When he saw the commotion, he swam back to shore to preemptively call emergency services. Thankfully, the ambulance did arrive right on time. The paramedics rushed out and assessed the situation with one of them immediately attending to Tom's wounds to stop the bleeding and stabilize him. It only took him a few minutes, but in the end, they took Tom into the ambulance along with his friends. On the way there, the paramedic told the young men they were brave for doing what they did and that Tom would be fine despite his blood loss. The paramedic was friendly and even cracked a few jokes that eased the tension. When they arrived at the hospital, the paramedics said they would admit him into their care and that the boys could either come back later to check on him or sit in the waiting room. They chose the latter. Eventually, they were informed that Tom was okay and would be released the following day. They helped him get back home with his family and supported him through his recuperation period. He never lost his love for the ocean or surfing, and he understood that the shark was acting on instinct and did not blame it for what happened. In his later years, Tom ended up steering his education toward marine biology, making it his major in college.
It's common knowledge that sharks tend to be aggressive animals in fight or flight situations. In most cases, the answer will be to fight. This happened to Claudia Montagna when she, her husband, and their six-year-old son went to Australia for a family vacation. The trip was scheduled for August 1972. They usually went skiing in the French Alps, but this time they decided to replace the frigid, adrenaline-filled adventure with lounging around on a beach in Perth. This would prove to be a fatal mistake. On their arrival at the airport, they had the entire day to enjoy themselves before checking into their hotel. So they toured the city for a few hours, taking in the sights and interacting with the people. Later in the day, they settled into their hotel room and got ready to visit the local beaches. They got to a clear spot in the sand when to their surprise, they ran into one of Claudia's friends who was also vacationing with her husband. They caught up as they hadn't seen each other in a long time, and her friend eventually invited them to a boat touring the coast of Perth bound for the following day. They all agreed. The rest of the day was spent in quiet comfort. Their son Langan played in the shallows all day, and the pair was reminiscing about old memories. The following day, the family met with Claudia's friend, Abigail, and her husband, Elliot, they were all about the same age, so they were not short on common topics and spent the time on the boat in good company. All in all, there were about 20 people on the boat from all walks of life. As the boat was nearing the halfway point, they noticed some commotion at the front of the boat, followed by people screaming. They sat there in confusion as they didn't understand what was going on. But eventually, someone passed the information down the boat informing them that they had hit an outcropping of rocks and that the hull of the boat was slashed open. The two families were scared senseless and bolted to their seats, unsure of what to do. They heard the tour guide say that they would focus all their energy on pointing the boat toward the shore, but they were still more than two miles out. Emergency services were notified and were on the way, but still a long way out. Claudia held Langan tightly telling him everything was all right and they would be fine. As the boat started filling up with water, they realized they would have to swim the rest of the way to the shore as the rescue boats were nowhere to be seen. They eased themselves into the water through the mass of people and swam together with Abigail and Elliot not far behind. The water was cold and immensely deep. They could feel the current slowly take them further from the shore, but they swam against it there were quite a few people in the water with them, all of them screaming and arguing with each other. As they swam forward, trying to keep Langan above water, Claudia's husband, Eric, felt something brush by his leg, followed by some discomfort. He pressed on, thinking it was a rock or something similar, never taking his eyes off his wife and child. A few moments later, he was shocked as he heard his wife cry out before being pulled under the surface with their son. He dove down under the surface to see what had happened, only to be met with a haunting sight. At least a dozen bull sharks rapidly swimming through the water, just below the people from the boat. He spotted a red mist directly underneath himself, and there he could see his wife's shocked face as she clutched onto their son. He swam down, hugged them tightly, and started kicking with everything he had. The shark let go of Claudia's leg before this, but Eric knew that it could have returned at any moment. Time was of the essence. They reached the surface of the water, but not before Eric himself felt the sharp teeth of another bull shark latch onto his thigh, ripping the muscles apart before letting go of him as well. He screamed about the threat of sharks in the water, which made all the people around them, Abigail included, scream and panic even more. The rescue boat was in the distance. Their blood was most likely why most of the sharks assembled around them, and Eric started to panic because of the pain in his leg and the feeling of the water surging around them. Claudia screamed in pain again and was pulled into the water again, still holding on to Langan. Eric held her tightly, but to no avail. He was pulled along with them, and he could feel another maw close in on his arm. He flailed around, completely blinded by the salty water, the blood, and the agony of the teeth grinding against his bones. 
Just as he thought he was going to die, he felt a pair of strong hands grip his arm and yank him out of the water with the shark. The beast let go of his arm as it met the air, and Eric kept screaming about his wife and son, still in the water and nowhere to be seen. He felt his vision fading due to the blood loss, and when he woke up again, he was in a hospital bed. He immediately shot up and started panicking, ripping his IV out of his arm. Abigail and Elliot entered the room, trying to calm Eric down. They informed him that Claudia and Langan did not make it. Their bodies were found somewhere around the site of the attack, but no one would let Eric see them because of his trauma and their state. He cursed the day they decided to go to Australia for their trip and spent the rest of the day sobbing. A few days later, he was discharged and contacted Abigail and Elliot. They helped him tend to his family, and he went back to France alone.